Uh, so uh, the, the short answer, it's not working for consumers. Um, the so-called consumer welfare framework has never been about the actual interests of consumers. It's been about essentially wealth maximization. And, you know, the, the, the big lie of the last 40 years has been uh, that we're trying to uh, serve the, the needs of consumers in any normal sense of the word. Uh, I think change is coming. I think more change is needed. Uh, just to give you some perspective, uh, our institute was founded uh, to really push for the, the views and voices of actual consumers in the ongoing debate <clears throat> for both antitrust and consumer protection. We were the only academic-based institute in the United States that does that. We don't take positions on cases. We certainly take positions on issues. So um, you know, I'm speaking on, on, on my own behalf and not, not on behalf of the university here. But uh, there's a lot of changes I'd like to see. One of them, and we're happy to go into as much detail as you wish, one of them is, um, I think the United States, and I've said this in various articles and speeches along the way, I think the United States, because of this misguided view over the last 40 years, has become an outlier in the global conversation about what competition policy means and how, uh, how that should be implemented. Uh, one example is how impoverished our law and policy and enforcement is with respect to uh, enf uh, enforcement against single firms with power unilateral conduct. Uh, the rest of the world more or less follows a model established by the European Union that talks about the abuse of a dominant position. And in comparison, the toolkit the United States has uh, is uh, very weak in comparison and the courts have been more and more uh, constricting that uh, at a time when the rest of the world is trying to figure out the best set of tools to deal with durable market power, both in tech markets and, and others. And so that, that's one area <clears throat> where I think we can learn a lot from the rest of the world. And rather than um, constantly shouting at them in different forum to uh, say change and be more like us, I think we should be listening and adopt uh, and, and incorporate into our law make statutory changes when necessary uh, to be more like them. Uh, I, I do, I think um, uh, even when the agencies, I, I commend the agencies for the cases that they've been uh, uh, bringing and, and looking at, but uh, vertical mergers, as you know, are fairly rare. They're, you know, they're, they're, there's a couple of important ones going on now. Um, the Justice Department certainly tried uh, in the um, uh, AT, um, in the AT and T Time Warner case. Uh, but I think the, the roadblock is in the judiciary uh, more than anything. I'd like to see the vertical uh, guidelines issued at the end of the Trump administration just chucked and, and and started over. I'd also like to see the courts take theories of foreclosure a, a little more seriously. I I, I think in many cases we can profit from a closer look at um, the business school literature, the, the academic literature, what firms actually do. And if the evidence supports it, if, if, if a couple of businesses really believe that a vertical merger is gonna help them entrench a dominant position at one or both of those markets, increase entry barriers, foreclose <coughs> um, uh, competitors at one level or another, or just empower their ability to discriminate against firms who are in one market, but not both. Uh, I think we should take that seriously. I think those should be challenged. Um, and I, I, I think the, the merger guidelines, to the extent that the courts will construe that as an indication of law, should be, should be revised. Um, I also, as you know, uh, published in Competition Policy International, uh, you know, a short piece with John Quokka, um, and where we talked about uh, uh, the, the, the agencies needing to be um, stronger about challenging deals in their entirety, less eager to take behavioral remedies under essentially any circumstances, and even less eager to take structural remedies. Uh, we call it fix it or forget it. We'd like to see firms come in with solid proposals as part of their filings or potentially with respect to a second request would be the latest, we would entertain it. Uh, we, want the firm, uh, we want the agencies to focus on building strong litigated cases to challenge mergers as a whole, except in the most de minimis circumstances. I don't think we have the time to get into de the details of all of the different proposals. I support uh, many of them, and I, 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 I would quibble with your, your question only because I think 
it's not inconsistent with the goals of antitrust to treat them as public utilities in the sense of imposing uh, requirements of non-discrimination akin to a common carrier. We've had, since the, the dawn of antitrust, um, uh, doctrines of essential facilities, refusals to deal, and other similar theories that have been applied to railroads. They've been applied to networks of other kinds, communication networks, they, uh, MCI versus AT&T. The whole theory of the, the, the Bell system breakup was an antitrust response to uh, a company that was blocking competition in certain competitive markets, relying on its sort of monopoly fortress that was still regulated at the time. So I know the state of the law. I'm not a fan of the Trinco opinion. Uh, it leaves a, a small window for essential facilities uh, claims to proceed. Uh, I think um, uh, most of Trinco is just wrong and misstates what our history has been. I know I'm, uh, I, I'm not the only one, but I know the majority view views things separately. Uh, I can also, again, point to the rest of the world that has embraced notions of exactly what you're talking about, that dominant firms, particularly where they uh, control a bottleneck, need to be able to serve all comers, whether they're ordinary consumers or potentially a customer who's also a competitor somewhere on the distribution chain in a fair and non-discriminatory <clears throat> manner. And if they don't, under most systems, uh, that's an antitrust violation as an abuse of a dominant position. We've got a narrower view on that. I'm happy to see that expand via case law or uh, statutory change. I think there is a vibrant community of progressive antitrust scholars that has changed and challenged the discourse, you know, uh, uh, centered around uh, the Bork view of what's important and what isn't important. Uh, I, I, that view exists. It's been it, it's been extraordinarily influential. Uh, it, it, it probably dominates at the Supreme Court. Uh, I'm happy to have a conversation about the kind of people we should have at the Supreme Court and at the lower court levels. I'd like to see judicial education changed. I'd like to see that there are, there are a multiplicity of views that comport with the law and the evidence in a particular case that allow um, uh, liability to be imposed when the facts and the evidence dictate. I and mean, I don't think all plaintiffs should win all cases. I do think the law should be enforced vigorously. And uh, I think right now the roadblock is in the federal judiciary. Uh, I'd like to see that changed. I'd like to see a serious an effort by this administration and other progressive administrations in the future to put smart, committed uh, people who have progressive views on antitrust uh, on the court the same way that the law was changed in large part because from Justice Powell uh, in the 70s uh, on, um, uh, the Supreme Court and lower courts and academic institutions have forcefully advocated for a different view of the world. I think it's caused great harm. I think there's an antitrust framework to challenge uh, those when you know when it's a, an attempt to sideline a serious potential actual or potential competitor. I don't think it should turn really on whether you call it a horizontal merger or a vertical merger or potential com competition merger. Um, obviously, it's hard to challenge an absolutely pure conglomerate merger under the existing case law. Um, but I don't think that's what the, the killer acquisitions are about. Um, I, I think there's plenty of ways of creating incentives for firms to be innovative and in startups and have exit paths for them other than just acquisitions by the dominant firms in their business. I'm worried when a dominant firm acquires a, a likely or a, a seriously promising a new entrant uh, for the idea of shutting them down. Uh, that's That to me is a legit antitrust theory when the facts so indicate, particularly, um, Again, uh, you know, business people talk uh, at all levels of generality and with all levels of bragging and sometimes a little more macho sense where, uh, you know, it comes out in the conversation. Um, you know, if, if that's the express purpose of an acquisition by a dominant firm that has the requisite likely effect on competition, I'm willing to take their, their word for it. I'm not willing to look for excuses to explain something that was done for this purpose and we have some reason to believe either that it will happen or that it has happened. You know, my view of the um, retrospective analysis of mergers 
uh, particularly the, the empirical work that John Corka and others have done, uh, leads me to think that you know a lot of the remedies that have been imposed uh, that that promise non-discrimination, non-retaliation, just don't work very well. Uh, you can look at Live Nation, Ticketmaster. You you can look at um, some really complex um, uh, uh, behavioral remedies in the tech sector that we talk about in our article for you. Um, but uh, it, it's more than can be expected of people to ask them or condition a deal on not behaving in exactly the way that best suits their interest. It's really hard to detect, enforce, and stop. Um, so I would rather create structural um, separation or other kinds of structural remedies. If you had a vibrant essential facilities doctrine, it might be less important. Um, but uh, you know, there's, there's a tradition. Uh, we don't do a lot of breakups in this country when we do so, like the AT&T in the 80s in particular, a couple others in, in history, it's to prevent uh, these incentives from arising in the first place. So um, I, I get that they're costs. Um, in my view, there's some circumstances where the costs are, uh, are worth it. I'm going to talk about one aspect of it that I, 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 I can't do all this, you know, and we'll be on the air for an hour and a half and that would bore everybody to tears. I'm going to talk about one aspect that I would guess your other guests have not talked about. Um, I'm concerned that the agencies have said in public and in certain cases, that, uh, and the courts have sometimes agreed with them, that public enforcement is more important than private enforcement, that there's somehow a hierarchy. Um, and I, I, I understand that, you know, if you're really talking about fundamental restructuring of an industry, it's more likely to come from the DOJ and the FTC than states, attorney generals or private plaintiffs. But I think in general, uh, there's a multiplicity of players. There's a multiplicity of goals. There's nothing in the antitrust laws that say treble damages are somehow less important and should take a backseat to what the government does. Um, the fact that we can't impose uh, fines for anything other than criminal conduct. Uh, leads me to think that you need all the above. I'd like to see the federal government become a more creative and positive partner with states even more than they do and with private plaintiffs. And uh, there will be sometimes limited number of times when an active grand jury investigation needs to be defended. Um, uh, you know, and, and maybe it's time to wait a little bit on a private case. But um, uh, I, I think it's wrong when the agencies take positions in court that they're more important than a private firm, uh, or that um, uh, the court should somehow uh, change the law to disadvantage private firms in favor of government enforcement. Uh, there are half a dozen amicus briefs where the courts take this stuff very seriously. It's very troubling. So I've been around long enough, Sam, that uh, to some extent, this is a repeat of uh, conversations in the 70s and the 80s uh, that focused on Japan more than China back then. And uh, I'm not sure my views have changed a lot. I was you know, uh, coming out of law school or very junior attorney during most of that conversation. Um, I don't think antitrust should be sidelined in favor of, I, I don't think the antitrust division should take those issues into account. Um, I, I, I do think antitrust is important. I don't think it's the only value. I view antitrust as part of a more democratic process that um, the antitrust division, the FTC's division, uh, the FTC and the courts in the case, their job is to analyze who wins and loses under a, a legal framework. And the broader public policy should be set by the most democratic institutions in our government. If competitiveness with China is a fundamental national policy, those goals should be set by Congress, uh, and or the, you know, the executive branch. And um, if the president or the cabinet uh, or the attorney general for some reason believes that there's some value other than antitrust that needs to trump a, a likely a, a antitrust investigation or case, uh, I don't think that's the job of the line um, attorneys. I don't think that's even the job of the FTC commissioners or the head of the antitrust division, who is an assistant attorney general, that's up the chain. And we can debate on any given situation, whether that's good for our country or not. But I, I think the debate needs to take place in Congress uh, to some extent at the highest levels of the executive branch, because 
that's who we vote for to set the fundamental public policies of our country. So I'm giving you a process answer rather than a substance answer. Um, but you know, um, in the past, uh, for example, uh, the antitrust division <clears throat> was prepared to indict uh, several companies, US and foreign in connection with the demise of Laker Airways in the 70s. Uh, I'm sorry, the early 80s. And um, uh, Margaret Thatcher and the British government begged uh, the Reagan administration not to do so. And uh, for various reasons, including just the strength of the US uh, English alliance. And so at some point, uh, the, the president directed the attorney general as he has the power to do so not to bring that indictment because of the greater national um, foreign policy interests, for example. Um, we can debate whether that was the right call, but that was the right person to make that call, uh, whether or not we agreed with it or disagreed. So I'm uncomfortable sucking those industrial policy issues into the day-to-day -day work of the agencies, or I suppose the, the, the courts trying to decide who wins and loses in a particular case. Um, I, I think that needs to be uh, bumped up the chain of command and really debated as a matter of fundamental national economic policy. I appreciate the chance to chat. Uh, uh, folks are, are, are interested in exploring this with me uh, or seeing my writing on this. Uh, like most law professors, I post most of my stuff on SSRN.com. Um, and uh, anybody who wants to know more about the, uh, the Antitrust in, you know, um, Institute uh, that I work with, uh, we're at luc.edu forward slash antitrust. And I appreciate the time to chat about these uh, great questions.